All right, let's talk very um, as, as in depth as possible about field size limitation in chapter 18. Here are my learning objectives. Um, so I want us to be able to identify guidelines and, and, and state them very explicitly for determining proper field size. Okay, um, we'll need to discuss how appropriate field size limitation um, decreases patient dose as well as potentially technologist dose, uh, increases uh, subject contrast and decreases scatter. Okay, um, We'll illustrate how collimators work. We'll talk about positive beam limitation and secondary shutters. And then we'll list both those image qualities that are affected by um, field size limitation and those that are not. We'll do the do's and don'ts. And then finally, I want us to talk uh, about compression because I think that even though this chapter doesn't mention compression, there's always kind of that interest in compression and, and so this will talk, we'll talk, it, it fits very well with thinking about field size limitation. They're basically two sides of kind of the same coin. So collimation and field size sometimes are used interchangeably in texts and things like that and so I'm going to very carefully define both those terms here in just a minute. But generally collimators decrease patient exposure appropriate use of collimators decreases patient exposure and increases subject contrast in the remnant beam. Okay? And the most common type of collimator used and that's out there is this one right here, the variable aperture collimator. Right? It's what you all use and what you think about when, when, when I say the word collimator. Um, and as a general rule of thumb, I like how nicely this is stated, the smaller the field size, the higher the subject contrast. That's in our textbook at the bottom of page 176. 276. Thank you. So um, here's a common point of confusion for students, though. Um, these collimation versus field size. I will use the terms in different ways. And really, they can be thought about in different ways. Um, but they are essentially two sides of the same coin. Collimation, when someone says they've increased collimation, and generally what they mean is I've got a field size that looks like this, and I cranked the collimators in. So I have increased collimation. What did I do to field size? I decreased the field size. So I want to be real careful about that, because it's a common point of confusion that if I'm increasing collimation, I'm decreasing the field size, right? But generally, we don't do the other way. We don't say that when I increase my field size, I'm decreasing collimation. We don't, for whatever reason, our minds don't generally run that direction. We just say I'm making the field size bigger, right? But something to think about. So when I increase my collimation, I'm, when I do this, my patient dose decreases. I'm, and, and it physically reduces the exposure area, right? physically reduces the exposure area, it's also reducing the amount of scatter production that's being produced. So it's reducing the area of exposure as well as reducing um, scatter. If I increase my field size, I just increased my patient dose, right? So since they're inversely related, this just allows us to see side by side what it is we're saying when we use these separate terminologies for the same kind of descriptive process. When I increase collimation, scatter radiation decreases. So by reducing the area, and the best one to think about probably on this is um, the L5S1 spot film that we do, right? Or an odontoid view. That we, want to we want to cone those in to, I think with the odontoid, it's roughly five inches square, and that's gonna reduce collimation, it's gonna reduce it's going to reduce the field size and reduce scatter radiation from all these hard bones in the skull. So it's a good, it's, our, it's, it's helpful in a lot of ways. That's going to increase subject contrast. Okay, here's a graphical way of thinking about that, and it's just talking about the rel. I'm going to zoom in here. Relative intensity of scatter radiation as we increase the field size. This isn't something to memorize or anything like that. It's just showing that as our receptor field size increases, the scatter is increasing exponentially, right? And that, that threshold that it's hitting, that ceiling that the curve is he hitting, is like the saturation point of the image receptor. That we're getting to a point where we couldn't have any more scatter than we already have, if that makes sense. 
Now, we had said in an earlier class that it's helpful to see side by side um, what, this, what I'm talking about in terms of the image itself, right? So let me pause real quick. So the first image here is an inappropriately coned pelvis image, and we can just see a lot of scatter. It's completely obliterated any SI joint, um, L5-S1 area. I can't see really very much of any detail in the area of the lumbar spine due to the amount of noise and fog and scatter that's apparent on this image. Um, if they had coned this in appropriately, it would have significantly reduced that noise. So let's, by comparison, look at an L-spine image where it has been coned somewhat, right? So this has been coned appropriately, um, uh, somewhat appropriately. It could be coned in just a little bit more. We do see a reduced amount of scatter. I can see the, the sacroiliac joints a little bit better. I can definitely see the, L, the lumbar spine better. Um, I can see spinous processes and things like that that were not apparent on that, that pelvic uh, view. And then finally, if I cone appropriately to the anatomy, look at how much just side by side, how much more detail is apparent on an appropriately coned image. Now, this is just a reduction in noise and an enhancement of subject contrast. This is not an increase in any geometrical factor of the image. This isn't an increase of resolution. This is not a change in uh, the focal spot size. This is not a change in OID or any of those geometrical factors. What I have is a reduced amount of noise, a reduced amount of con uh, scatter, and so an increased subject contrast has resulted. Does that make sense? It's not a geometrical factor, it's a visibility quality factor. I'll say that one more time. It is not a spatial resolution thing. It is purely a uh, visibility thing. All right, well, let's break down the anatomy of the collimator and think about what parts are important, the parts that uh, we need to focus on the most in order to understand how best to use it. The collimator box is always mounted to the tube, right? That variable aperture collimator box. And the first part that we should understand about the, the collimator box is that it has a positive beam limitation device. And this was initially um, installed into collimators as a radiation safety mechanism. And the idea being that before there were PBLs, um, you could cone to a size larger than the image receptor that you had. Right? The positive beam limitation says as soon as you, as soon as you put an image receptor in the Bucky slot, it senses what the image receptor is, what size it is, and it cones to just that image receptor size. You all have probably been very, very spoiled by this. It's a, it's a great thing, right? The, only, the older, sc older school machines, you physically had to turn a key to override the PBL. You could turn a key in the collimator box and you could override the PBL and at that point you could make it larger or smaller. The only reason to override the PBL is to reduce the field size. I'll say that again because I think it's on your quiz. You only override it if you want a field size smaller than the PBL. Because what they found when they initially installed these PBLs in collimators, it was fixed. And text being maybe busy or lazy or whatever you want to say, they would just run with the collimation that was fixed in the box, right? <coughs> that actually wound up fighting against appropriate collimation. Most of the digital systems that we work on today have a PBL designed such that you cannot cone out greater than it, but you can easily override it to cone in, right? So this is almost a null factor. Just know that when you are coning in, you are overriding the PBL. You didn't have to disengage a lock or anything, but you did just override the PBL. By coning in, you overrode it. You didn't have to disengage a lock. Does that make sense? Because you'll probably get a registry question that's like, when should you override or overriding the PBL? And you'll be like, I've never over overrode a PBL in my life. I have no clue what this question is about. Yes, you have. You do it every day and don't even think about it, right? Because the engineers recognized that it was actually, it was designed to help reduce patient radiation dose and it was actually cutting against it slightly because the override was too clunky. Now, collimators have two sets of shutters, and so we need to rewind to some radiation physics stuff here in order to understand why these, there's two sets of shutters in this collimator. So um, the, the point being, I'll zoom in here in just a minute, but I wanna read the slide real quick. Um, 
there is secondary shutters that are lower down. They're closer to the patient. They're the ones that you can actually see. Um, if you look at that collimator right there, you can actually see the secondary shutters. Those are what are working. I'll pass it around. The purpose for the secondary shutters is to reduce what we would call off-focus or extra-focal radiation. So put an exclamation point by that part of the slide because this is probably the only time I'm going to discuss this phenomena, right? Um, it is roughly 25% of the beam exiting the tube we could call off-focus radiation. That's, that's a considerable amount of radiation exiting the x-ray tube. Um, it results from scatter leaving the anode, right? and hitting either the glass envelope of the tube or hitting something else inside the x-ray tube and producing a secondary x-ray, right? So that x-ray that just was produced is not at the focal spot of the anode. It was produced off in the glass envelope. It was produced somewhere else. And there's actually a good illustration of this, very simple illustration of it in our textbook on page 274 that just shows how this off-focus radiation is more likely to be stopped by the secondary collimators than the primary collimators. So that's one of the reasons why we want a collimator box. That's part of the engineering. We're not, that's not going away because we want a second set of collimators that's a little bit further away from the tube itself in order to limit some of this off-focus radiation. Um, the result of off-focus radiation is kind of a ghosting effect, and frankly, digital systems know that it's there and they do a lot to eliminate it. So you've probably never noticed ghosted images out at kind of the periphery of uh, the anatomy of interest, um, but that's what the way that off-focus radiation could affect um, our x-ray pictures. Okay, so what do collimators do? Um, well, first off, let's have a rule of thumb. We said that we needed a hard and fast rule. Always allow at least one inch of light beyond the anatomy of interest. Use your, your shadow casting techniques from the, uh, the flashlight lab. Yes, half inch. Did I say something different? Okay, half inch, a half inch of light beyond the anatomy of interest. Sorry for confusing that term. And that actually is in our textbook, a recommendation made in the textbook. Um, the, the registry will not say specific ask you for a specific amount right it will ask you for a range like it'll say like a half to one inch or something like that right um, roughly a centimeter one centimeter would be another way of saying the same thing um, so that's our little guideline for how best to use collimation so do collimate to within a half inch of the anatomy of interest and use your imagination to know what that anatomy of interest would be. Like for example, with that AP hip x-ray that I showed you earlier, the anatomy of interest is not necessarily the skin margin, right? The anatomy of interest is the pelvis, right? It is the pelvis. So I can cone down to roughly the area of the pelvis. I can use landmarks and stuff to figure out where I should be coning to, right? Um, Collimation only affects the visibility functions of the image. And to the extent that collimation reduces scatter, it reduces image noise. Okay? So, again, don't be confused. It does not affect those geometrical things like spatial resolution. It is affecting visibility. And appropriate, I italicize that, appropriate collimation reduces patient dose and scatter and increases subject contrast. So it's, it gets a big thumbs up for that. It's a win-win, right? Because appropriate collimation improves contrast and reduces dose. And that's the most common question that gets asked about it on the registry and things like that is, what's the number one way to reduce dose and improve subject contrast? Well, collimation. Okay, so first off, in terms, in terms of your own personal technique, don't over collimate and clip anatomy of interest. Now what you're going to find sometimes at these orthopedic facilities that you'll go to this summer is that they are asked by their physicians to keep the collimators open, right? A physician has asked me to keep my collimators open. I'm going to do what the physician says. They know more about what they're looking at than I do, right? 
I can look at the picture and determine do I have good contrast and stuff like that, and I might have to window and level, but if there was some measurement or some additional device that they, they're thinking about affixating to this broken hip or whatever, they might need that additional margin to measure, right? So they are doing a lot of orthopedic measurements, especially looking, again, if we go back to the pelvis, they might need to view the entire pelvis if they're planning surgery for a hip replacement because they want to measure the lesser uh, trochanter and see if it's in alignment with the ramus, mm -hmm. right? And that's the way that they make sure that they don't have a patient that's walking around with one leg shorter than the other. That's an important thing, right? That you're not having patients that are walking around with one leg shorter than the other. I think it's more important to have the collimators wide open then, right? So do what the physician asks for, right? I'm not saying uh, supermine the, uh, or over, override the uh, physician. And the other caveat with that is that um, repeat exposures equal a double dose. If I was trying to collimate appropriately to, or in order to reduce patient dose and I clipped anatomy of interest, guess what? I just doubled patient dose because I got to do a repeat exposure that's exactly twice the dose, right? So use it with, it's, it, I'm giving you quite a bit of power and quite a bit of uh, artistic expression in, in the way that we use this, but think about those. None of, again, I'll say it, this is the third time I've said it, none of the geometric functions of image production are affected by field size, but, right, there's always this pesky other thing. And the pesky other thing for us is compression. Who here has seen physicians using a compression paddle? Good. So we're familiar with this device. Compression operates the exact same as collimation. So that's great. That's helpful, right, as a student to know, okay, any question I see about compression, I don't need to freak out because Benny said it works pretty much the same as collimation. So it's going to serve to reduce exposure. Right? It's going to reduce scatter. It's going to enhance um, subject contrast. Right? And we'll look at what that looks like here in just a minute with two different studies that use it differently. But um, compression might also serve to reduce OID and thereby slightly reduce magnification. So we're being a little bit annoying here. But if I'm pressing on someone, right, particularly in the area of their small bowel or large intestine, in order to better see that area, I am potentially pressing that anatomy closer to the image receptor and therefore decreasing OID. So I could potentially, with compression, also be um, changing something like spatial resolution or magnification, right? But for the most part, if you just remember that Benny said compression is pretty much the same thing as collimation, you're good to go, right? Here's some examples of situations where we use compression in order to improve subject contrast. The first one that pops to mind is trying to better visualize, uh, I guess this is a small bowel or something here, a loop of small bowel. And you can see there's just total saturation down in here, the area that's not compressed. But look at all the subject contrast I can see in here. I can even see like this little burp or fart or whatever that's in there, right? Um, another example of compression is mammography, right? They do compression all day long for the exact same reason, right? Okay, thank you.